cord. Okay, so we'll continue on here. So um, talking about radical feminism, this struggle includes opposing the sexual object objectification of women, raising public awareness about such issues as rape and violence against women, challenging the concept of gender roles and challenging what radical feminists see as racialized and gendered capitalism that characterizes the United States and many other countries. According to Shulamith Firestone in The Dialectic of Sex, The Case of Feminist Revolution, 1970, the end goal of feminist revolution must be unlike that of the first feminist movement, not just the elimination of male privilege, but of the sex distinction itself. Genital differences between human beings would no longer matter culturally. While radical feminists believe that differences in genitalia and secondary sex characteristics should not matter culturally or politically, they also maintain that women's special role in reproduction should be recognized and accommodated without penalty in the workplace. And some have argued compensation should be offered for this socially essential work. Early radical feminism arising within second wave feminism in the 1960s typically viewed patriarchy as a trans historical phenomenon prior to or deeper than any sources of oppression, not only the oldest and most universal form of domination, but the primary form and the model for all others. Later politics derived from radical feminism ranged from cultural feminism to more syncretic politics that placed issues of class, economics, et cetera, on a par with patriarchy as sources of oppression. Radical feminists locate the root cause of women's oppression in patriarchal gender relations, <clears throat> as opposed to legal systems, as in liberal feminism, or class conflict, as in anarchist feminism, socialist feminism, or Marx and Marxist feminism. Okay, radical feminists locate the root of women's oppression in patriarchal gender relations. So theology and ideology. Radical feminists assert that global society functions as a patriarchy in which the class of men are the oppressors of the class of women. They propose that the oppression of women is the most fundamental form of oppression, one that has existed since the inception of humanity. As radical feminist T. Grace Atkinson wrote in her foundational piece, Radical Feminism, 1969. Elaine? Yes. Um, up above where it said the root, yeah. um, the root cause, right. is that basically the core issue of women? Is, that's, I mean, that's how I understand it. Um, okay. there, I mean, if I'm following correctly, the agreement, there, we're in agreement with that, that um, it's the oppression of, from the yes. patriarchal gender relations. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, keep an eye out <laughs> for the stuff that's not, you know what I mean? <laughs> to understand what's not. But they're, they're, how do I say it? That's the path we're supposed, we need to be growing on is um, yeah. no distinction between um, the male and female and the patriarchal system done away with. That's the way I understand it. Yes. So radical feminists assert, assert that global society functions as a patriarchy in which the class of men, okay, we finished that one. Um, the first di dichotomous division of this mass, mankind, is said to have been on the grounds of sex, male and female. It was because half the human race bears the burden of the reproductive process, and because man, the rational animal, had to had the wit to take advantage of that, that the child bearers or the beasts of burden were corralled into a political class, equivocating the biologically contingent burden into a political or necessary penalty, thereby modifying these individuals' definition from the human to the functional or animal. So the man is a rational animal. Is that what I'm saying? You're seeing? Man is a rational 
animal was because the half human half human race bears the burden of reproduction because man the rational animal had the wit to take advantage of that so he took advantage of women because the women had the burden of reproductive reproduction that the child bearers or the beasts of burden were corralled into a political class equivocating the biologically contingent burden into a political or necessary penalty thereby modifying these individuals de the individuals definition from the human to the functional or the animal or animal i don't think i quite get this last part does anybody understand that <clears throat> Well, it's, what it sounds like to me is that because women were childbearers, there was a, you know, in childbearing, you have a certain period before and after where you can't do anything. Right. You know, you, you're, you're pregnant, so you can't work, you can't lift, um, so on and so on. And so men being a so-called a rational animal, saw this as an opportunity. So they were op opportunistic as to make them a second class because they weren't as good uh, as men. They weren't as productive as men because men did not have this burden. So instead of making this individual case, it, it, they politicized it to make the whole the whole of the womankind to be, uh, I guess, second class. I got that so, part. you get that so very they, much. So, so, they, so they penalized. Right. So yes, yeah, so they penalized the woman as, as a society, as a whole. So that last part, though, is the part that I don't get. Therefore, I'm modifying these individuals, the women, right? Yes. Modifying the women, the women's definition from the human to the functional or animal. They, it, it, so they, so to me, the way I, what I think I understand about that is it, their, their being was reduced to what they can and cannot do. Is it, instead of seeing them as a whole person, you know, to the functional, what can they do and can they not do? And so since they cannot do certain things while being pregnant, <clears throat> this is what they were reduced to. No, uh, rather than a person or animal, you know, um, basically instinctive. You can do this, and, but, you, you know, you cannot do that. Therefore, you're not a whole person. You're not a, you're not a whole human being. That, that's what I understand that as. Okay. It all has to do with function. You know, what's your function? Yeah. Thereby modifying these, the women, this is the women, right? The women's definition or, or their definition from the human to the functional or animal. Maybe we'll find more as we go through here. Radical feminists argue that because of patriarchy, Women have come to be viewed as the other to the male norm, and as such have been systematically oppressed and marginalized. They further assert that men as a class benefit from the systemic oppression of women. Patriarchal theory is not defined by a belief that all men always benefit from the oppression of all women. Patriarchal theory is not defined by a belief that all men always benefit from the oppression of all women. Rather, it maintains that the primary element of patriarchy is a relationship of dominance where one party is dominant and exploits the other for the benefit of the former. Radical feminists believe that men as a class use social systems and other methods of control to keep women as well as non-dominant men suppressed that's interesting here too, the ones that, is that talking about weak men? Well, probably in, in that category is homosexuals. That's what I was 
that's what I was thinking just when we were talking about um, you know when she was doing the message on going back through Greece and the history of Greece so they're the weak ones the non-dominant they're not um, they're suppressed instead of oppressed treated as I don't know if it's the same but treated like those like in the, like the Greeks treated the ones that were they were either a child or not grown up or not mature or are going to be a male feminine personality or I don't know if personality is the right word to use. So radical feminists seek to abolish patriarchy by challenge, challenging existing social norms and institutions and believe that eliminating patriarchy will liberate everyone from an unjust society. Ty Grace Atkinson maintained that the need for power fuels the male class to continue oppressing the need for the male class to continue oppressing the female class, arguing that the need men have for the role of oppressor is the source and foundation of all human oppression. Wow. The need men have the need men have for the role of oppressor is the source and foundation of all human oppression. The influence of radical feminist politics. You know, it's really interesting in reading this though and realizing that it's not just the, hope I'm okay in saying this. It's not just the women that are, um, you, you know, because when we look at us in this movement and listening to the presentations, there's, it's men, men and women that are, that are still fighting against this because both have to break free. From it, both have the message has to work on both male and female, because the female is oppressed, the male is the oppressor, and that's what they know. That's what they've always the the role that is is you know society. I don't want to say I don't know if say dictates, but you know that's the way society is all set up. We can see that's what they want to break, but um, but the men have to also come free. From this as well, because they they the need the need men have for the role of oppressor is the source and foundation. So, like she talked about in Greece, the dominance um, dominance and power that, that they had to dominate. And a man that did not, a male that did not dominate, was a was a child or immature, or they put in the category of the women. But this is all this is all apis bull. Yeah, yeah. The the need for dominance. Yeah. And I, I don't know if they want to give that up. Yeah. And in my experience, I mean, I came out of my situation many, many, many years ago, unscathed, very thankful, um, you know, emotional harm that I healed from, but no physical, um, no physical harm. And it was relatively easy for me. I had some support system, you know, a little bit of support system here and there that helped to, um, you know, not just leave me completely on my own or destitute. And I was also very determined to just get back out in the workforce and go. But, but when you take away their power, and this is, this is, I'm sure what scares some of the women, when you take away their power, it can go either way. For me, when I took away his power, and by taking away his power, I mean I never I did not give in to his behavior anymore. I didn't I didn't participate in that behavior anymore. I became my own person, stood my ground and said what I was going to tolerate and what I wasn't, and you either like it or you don't. And uh, but it can also go really bad when they start exercising that freedom in their voice as well. And um, so it's a scary thing to to for for um, women to you know, a lot of reasons women, a lot of reasons women stay. And I know money was one of them too, and very difficult to leave. Okay, so, the, so the influence of radical feminist politics on the women's liberation movement was considerable. Red Stockings co-founder Ellen Willis wrote in 1984 that radical feminists got sexual politics recognized as a public issue. Um, created second wave feminism's vocabulary, helped to legalize abortion in the USA, 
were the first to demand total equality in the so-called private sphere, housework and childcare, emotional and sexual needs, and created the atmosphere of urgency that almost led to the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. The influence of radical feminism can be seen in the adoption of these issues by the National Organization of Went for Women, a feminist group that had previously been focused mostly, almost entirely on economic issues. Radical feminists in the United States coined the term women's liberation movement. The WLM grew largely due to the influence of the civil rights movement that had gained momentum in the 60s. And many of the women who took up the cause of radical feminism had previous experience with radical protests in, in the struggle against racism. Chronologically, it can be seen within the context of second wave feminism that started in the early 60s. The leading figures of this second wave of feminism included Shulamith Firestone, Kathy Sarachild, Ty Grace Atkinson, Carol Hansett Hanish, Roxanne Dunbar, Naomi Weistein, and Judith Brown. In the late 60s, various women's groups describing themselves as radical feminists, such as the UCLA Women's Liberation Front, offered differing views of radical feminist ideology. UCLA's WLF co-founder Deborah Weber recalls the radical feminists were opposed to patriarchy, but not necessarily capitalism. In our group, at least, they opposed so-called male-dominated national liberation struggles. Radical feminists helped to translate the radical protest for racial equality in which many had experience over to the struggle for women's rights. They took up the cause and advocated for a variety of women's issues, including abortion rights, the Equal Rights Amendment, access to credit, and equal pay. Many women of color were among the founders of the women's liberation movement. Fran Beal, Celestine Ware, Tony Cade, Bambera. However, many women of color did not participate in the movement due to their conclusion that radical feminists were not addressing issues of meaning for minority women. Black women in particular, after consciousness raising groups were formed to rally support, second wave radical feminism began to see an increasing number of women of color participating. So they were still having a, their own little segregation going on in there, if I'm following that correctly. And it's interesting when you want to fight for equality that you don't, that you want to pick and choose how you fight for equality, if that makes sense. Um, and still look at, at various races rather than you're all women fighting for your rights. In the 1960s, radical feminism emerged within liberal feminists and working class feminist discussions, first in the United States, then in the United Kingdom and Australia. Those involved had gradually come to believe that it was not only the middle class nuclear family that oppressed women, but that it was also social movements and organizations that claimed to stand for human liberation, notably the counterculture the new left and Marxist political parties, all of which were male dominated and male oriented. In the United States, radical feminism developed as a response to some of the perceived failings of both new left organizations, such as the Students for a Democratic Society and feminist organizations, such as now. In Initially concentrated in big cities like New York, Chicago, and Boston, Washington, DC, and on the West Coast, radical feminist groups spread across the country rapidly from 1968 to 1972. At the same time, parallel trends of thinking developed outside the USA. The Women's Yearbook 
from Munich gives a good sense of early 1970s feminism in West Germany. So we'll read that so we can see that we can see this working in other countries. And this just makes me think about um, 1989 and the, the coming out film that was playing the same night of the fall of the Berlin Wall. So you have this happening before 1989 and it's happening elsewhere. Does some, would you like to read, Phil? Or anybody else? Uh, I can, if nobody wants to read, I can read. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, their yearbook essay on behalf of the autonomous feminist movement argued that patriarchy was the oldest and most fundamental relationship of exploitation. Hence the necessity of feminists separating from men's organizations on the left, since they would just use women's efforts to support their own goals in which women's liberation did not count. The editors of Frau Jabruch, 76, also explicitly distanced themselves from the language of liberalism, arguing that equal rights define women's oppression as women's disadvantage. They explicitly labeled the equal rights version of feminism as wanting to be like men vehemently rejecting claims that women should enter all the male-dominated areas of society. <clears throat> more women in politics, more women in the sciences, etc. Women should be able to do everything that men do. Their position and that of the autonomous feminist represented in the 1976 yearbook instead was that. This principle that we want that too or we can do it too, measures emancipation against men and again, and again defines what we want in relationship to men. Its content is conformity to men because in this society, male characteristics fundamentally have more prestige, recognition, and above all, more power. We easily fall into the trap of rejecting and devaluing all that is female and admiring and emulating all that is considered male. The battle against the female role must not become the battle for the male role, the feminist demand, which transcends the claim for equal rights is the claim for self-determination. So this is the feminist, they say the feminist, okay. The feminist demand which transcends the claim for equal rights is the claim for self-determination. The battle against the female role must not become the battle for the male role. Is this the feminists that say this part? Or this is what the feminists demand? I have to, I'm sorry, I have to ask questions because I'm, I can be slow at comprehension. I'm not sure if that was the feminist or if that was the editors of the Frauenjahr book. That, that they're saying that the feminist demand was Yeah, let's, so let's read that from there again. Okay. The editors of Frauenjahr book 76 also explicitly distanced themselves from the language of liberalism, arguing that equal rights define women's oppression as women's disadvantage. They, okay, explicitly labeled the equal rights version of feminism as wanting to be like men, vehemently rejecting claims that women should enter all the male dominated areas of society. More women in politics, more women in the sciences, etc. Women should be able to do everything that men do. Their position and that of the autonomous feminist represented in this 1976 yearbook Instead was that, this principle that we want, okay, instead, instead was that. So whose position was that instead of that? Was it the feminist or was it well, this think, uh, editors? I think, um, let me see, women should be able to do everything a man could do, their position, promises, instead of that. And I think that is the next sentence. 
so this and that. I think that's what I'm talking about. Their position and that of the autonomous feminist represented instead was like it seems like it should say this and instead it says that. I think it's comparing this to that. Is that what I'm understanding? Women should be. No, I'm not women. sure. Women should anybody be else? Women. Anybody else? They're they're saying um, explicitly they explicitly labeled the equal rights version of feminism as wanting to be like men, vehemently rejecting claims that women should enter all the male dominated areas of society, like having more women in politics, more women in the sciences. So are they are they the, the editors are they talking against it right? Yes, the editors who are against the, the liberalism. Right. They don't want women to be um, like men to do everything that men do. Okay. So their position and that of the autonomous feminists represented in this yearbook instead was that this principle, I think that's the way it's supposed to read, instead was that this principle but it's just going into a quote. Okay, so, and their position and that of the autonomous feminist represented in this 76 yearbook instead was that this principle that we want to do, we want that too, or we can do it too, measures emancipation against man and again defines what we want in, a real, in relationship to men. Its content is conformity to men. Because in this society, male characteristics fundamentally have more prestige. So if you don't have male characteristics, you're lacking in prestige, recognition, and above all, more power. So if you don't have male, male, char male characteristics, you have less prestige, less recognition, and above all, because the men have, have the power, they have the prestige, they have the recognition, and they have all the power. We easily fall into the trap of rejecting and devaluing all that is female and admiring and emulating all that is considered male. The battle against the female role must not become the battle for the male role. So go ahead and have your battle, but don't, don't fight to have the male role. Where they draw the line, I don't know. So the feminist demand, which transcends the claim for equal rights, is the claim for self-determination. So that's them in their document that says that, but the feminist demand, which transcends the claim for equal rights, is the claim for self-determination. So their demand is for self-determination, correct? Yes, that's what I'm saying. So the feminist demand is for self-determination. Okay. Not <clears throat> meaning, meaning what? That they get determined what they can, what they're capable of and what they can do and not do and what they can choose to do. Like if they want to be in politics or they want to be in the sciences, if they want to do so, something so, mandate. So, yeah, so they want to define. It's, it's, so it doesn't necessarily mean that they want to be like men, but if they choose to, you know, they don't want to be defined by men because it's the women's roles and, and it sounds like you know being women in in, period, in general is all defined by men how men sees them uh, and you know men put women in, in this box of what they can or cannot do so the women uh the feminists they demand is they want to be able to determine what as women can and cannot do or should or should not do right so if they want to get into politics and they have every right to get into politics if they don't want to get into politics then they don't have to get into politics but they should have that right they should have that right okay anybody else comment on that Uh, there's one, uh, go back here, when it first started, because it gives the reason that they're 
not trying to uh, dominate themselves over the men. They're seeing it as a quality, an equality thing. They're not challenging men. Where was that? It was in the- Yeah, I know, I know which one you're talking about because I read it twice and it- Yeah. And uh, I thought it was in this paragraph, but maybe, it was in a paragraph I read, maybe. Maybe, I thought it was in that um, uh, portion there about the, the editors. I could be wrong, but. Wanting to be like men, that's not the one that was different because I know I read it. Yeah. Wanting to be like men. If that really defines it, you know, what their goal was. Yeah. The radical, the radical feminist. Mm. Mm. I'm just trying to scan back through it. Yeah. Because I know I know the the passage you're referring to, and I just can't remember where it was at. I don't think it was as far back. I don't either. I think it's in this portion right here now. Hmm. It was to 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 not try to have the role of man role that was that, role that's right Christine yeah. that's right how do I search in here for a word what are you searching in where in oh, the document right if you right. um are you searching for the whole word yeah right there yeah Can you hear um, me? How do I put in the word that I want? Oh, there we so, go. Um, cl click on the little X. Gets rid of yeah. Type. Okay. And that took us. That took us someplace completely different to a different page. So I thought the word "role" was in there. This one's it right here. There it is. Oh, That's the one you're you're looking battle for. Battle against the female role must not become the battle for the male role. Exactly. There it is. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah, that's quite a big difference. Right. <laughs> Between radical feminism and um, bottom of the paragraph. Would you say first wave feminists? They had a different a different idea about it with men, or is the battle with the um, with the radical feminists. Did they? The radical feminists came out of the uh, first wave feminism, right? Right. That's what I understood. Yeah. But they had. Did they have different goals? I mean, we're kind of getting off the subject of it, but or did they stand alone in this, this thinking as, as feminists? Radical feminism is just a division of feminism. So right. there's different versions of feminism. The, the, um, the fight for equal rights between men and women, you know, and, um, women defining what that is and within each division of feminism you have um i guess i don't want to say it you have the different methods of which the women are using to fight you know um against the sexism or you know to fight for their rights and what that looks like and and their def definition of you know um woman you know, and uh, and where they stand, and you have the different perceptions within those within the divisions of feminism, um, and how they see it, right? And so we're focusing on um, the uh, faction of radical feminism, um, and to understand because that is in alignment to what the movement you know, um, agrees with 
though there is division within, we know there's a division in, within radical feminism that um, is much more narrow um, because there's a sect of radical feminism that does not um, accept transgender um, so or transgender community. So um, yeah, that's what we're we're looking at in there. Okay. And yeah, this is just that to pick up. Go ahead, Jackie. Sorry. Now I was just gonna say that's a good explanation. It really defines it much more, although you have a group of feminists, and within that group, there's different fractions. Right. Splintered. Yep. Divided. So that was Victoria that was giving that uh, thought. Thank you. Yeah. And um, just going back to that, this other one that I highlighted, the need for power fuels the male class to continue oppressing the female class, arguing that the need men have for the role of oppressor is the source and foundation of all human oppression. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a sickness all around. Oh, yes. Um, and, yeah, and, and when we look at what we're learning about um, the three structures, right? Um, modern Israel, the Millerite history in, in, our, in our history, and then the counterfeit, and then the Protestants, we see that, you know, we look at the threats, right? When they perceive a threat. And for men, that's a big threat to have women stand up and fighting for to no longer be oppressed and to be put onto an equal it's just, just the same. It's the same thing, you know. It's equal rights all around. It's the same thing with race. It's the same thing with the LGBT community. Is to, to, you know, why should people have to fight for what has, what belongs to them by right? You know, equal rights. Looking at the Declaration of Independence, all have the have the right for, you know, for equality for equity and but the need men have for the role of oppressor is the source and foundation of all human oppression so it's what they've grown up in it's all they've known and and they don't want to lose what they have and and, and I, I think also maybe somebody could help me with we got some men on here um i know i was probably i don't know i don't want to say guilty of um but viewed as is the word emasculating? Is that the word? Emasculating men? Is that how you say that word? That's correct. Yes, emasculate. Okay. It threatens their, their manhood, right? Well, though yeah, those who are not comfortable with their own manhood, yes. Okay. Okay. And thrive on power. And so they'll fight back to keep the women in their place. And it's interesting when you think about the different ways that they do it, because when we look at the evangelical world, look at those women. They're obedient little women in their family structure. And that's sad because they think God wants them to be that way. Yes. Um, submissive. Totally submissive. This helped me understand at least um, because I when we were reading some of the articles on Trump, you know, a couple of years ago or whatever, and then the articles were coming out about the, the wives of these evangelicals and plus the four years of Trump and seeing some of these, so many of these women that support him and love him. I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know what I mean? That, why do you, why do you support that kind of behavior? And, and, but it's the, their belief system. That, that is their role to be submissive and they get very threatened when a woman expresses her or expresses um uh trying to think of the right word is 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 can be the um can be more dominating speaks her mind speaks her mind thank you yeah yeah like what you actually have a mind of your own yeah we do and um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to battle out the struggle in, in my mind that they perceive this obviously as a threat 
to, they don't want women because they feel the way they would, re, you know, I don't know how to put it into words. They lose their, they, their fear is they're losing their power and their strength and their manhood and, and whatever else. But what Fell said is true. Yeah. Because they're, they're, I mean, they're more often than not cowards. Um, but to be able to oppress someone makes you feel strong and powerful. Does yeah. insecurity fall into that too? Does what? Insecurity. In, or, yeah, yeah, I think so. Sure. Yeah. Or too, just that it's, um, it, since that's the way it always is, they just, it's just their right. They believe it's their natural right without paying attention to the, to the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, I guess they just believe it's their right. No one wants to wants to lose their rights, and it's not their rights. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, if anybody else has anything else to say, I'm just thinking it out loud as well, too. So. Yeah, just spark some thoughts um, with the spokesman against radical feminism uh, on the radio. He passed away, what, a couple of years ago, Rush Lumbaugh. Mm -hmm. Oh, he preached at Poe. He had every name in the book to call those women. And, you know, I could understand why he had a very uh, turbulent marriage and was divorced, I think, once or twice. And, you know, he was all powerful in this message about the feminists. So, uh, and that was back in the, Mm, I would say the early 70s. Rush Limbaugh for or against the feminists? Oh, he was against the feminists. Yeah, okay. He called thought. them fem feminists. Okay, wow, well, okay. That was his word for them. Yeah, I mean, it's all clicking in my mind now where all this was coming from now that we're reading this and studying this now. Yeah. And he was fearful of his own position, like we've already, several have already said, of his role. And he thought that the feminist women were a, were a threat. They were the perceived threat to men. Well, I, I've run into before many times. And he had a power, powerful microphone. Yeah, he yeah, did. He just you know, blasted it continually. Yeah. yeah, I've run into in my past men that are definitely threatened by and don't like strong women. And um, it, it is hard for some women to, to, to find that voice. And so I, I think that's where we, um, there, there'll be some help along. The, I don't, I don't know how it's, what it's going to look like. You know what I mean? I think it's really interesting because the presentation that was done during this recent camp meeting, mm -hmm. and I am forgetting her name. Hmm. I don't think it was Natasha, but she. Elisa. Yeah, the one who did the presentation about the history um, uh, that went back to um, Eve. You know, Adam. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that presentation, I mean, that was powerful because it really took you back to see when the woman's voice was lost, you know, right. and and now we're in the time where um, our voices is being restored, you know, and that, I think that history, I mean, it's really a lot of this, it is, it is the start of the patriarchal system, you know, and how it all originated right um, woman losing her voice and being in that um i don't know i don't want to put it like that in that submissive place you know what i'm saying like i know that comes out kind of wrong but just the the history of where that where it all started you know um and how from generation and generation you know this has just been you know, like playing out, um, you know, and yeah, so we are living in um, truly unprecedented times, you know, when the, um, um, with the civil rights movements and how they um, came about before our history to, you know, um, 
yeah in which god worked in restoring you know his people so yeah there are some things that i really want to focus on trying to understand it so that for all of us or all of us that so that we can give the right argument and i've been back on those um on the elder parminder's presentations again and trying to revisit matthew 19 still to really know how to argue these issues that we're going to face for the sake of those that are going to be set free you know what i'm saying the like the issue of what we're reading here about the issue of male dominance but also the issue of um being able to say he made them male and female made them man and wife being able to being able to to address those with a person to where they can understand it I don't know if anybody, if you know what you know what I'm talking about. I think. Yes, yes, I I understand what you're saying, um, and yeah, God is definitely has given us the tools to help us in those, um, but it really is important as we're you know reading and understanding the history um, right. to be and having the proper methodology to be able to explain it. I that that's really helping us and. Um, yeah, and, and also to know that you know Jesus says, "My sheep hear my voice; they'll they'll hear him, just like we heard him in the message." Amen. They'll hear him in the message, and uh, um, but you know we're definitely going to be going up against those that are fighting using the "Thus saith the Lord," and there, you know, there's going to be those that that won't hear anything because they're going to stay where the Pharisees stayed with their "Thus saith the Lord" instead of understanding. Um, I've been working on a baptism class on Monday and and going through, um, we talked about this the other day too, I brought it up, um, about how they never want to listen to the prophet in their own day. Because the prophet in their own day is going to um, make application. Whereas, you know, like when they would they would refer to Moses and Jesus had to set them straight, you didn't understand the principles that Moses was laying out you're just taking the literal and I'm here to tell you the principle and teach you the principle and they wouldn't hear it because they wanted to stick with their thus saith the Lord. Okay. If you want to keep going, Phil, thank you guys. Radical feminists introduced the use of Consciousness raising CR groups. These groups brought together intellectuals, workers, and middle class women in developed Western countries to discuss their experiences. During these discussions, women noted a, a, women noted a shared and repressive system, regardless of their political affiliation or social class. Based on these discussions, the women drew the conclusion that ending of patriarchy was the most necessary step towards a truly free society. These consciousness raising sessions allowed early radical feminists to develop a political ideology based on common experiences women faced with male supremacy. Consciousness raising was extensively used in chapter subunits of the National Organization for Women, now during the 1970s. The feminism that emerged from these discussions stood first and foremost for the liberation of women as women from the oppression of men in their own lives as well as men in power. Radical feminism claimed that a total totalizing ideology and social formation patriarchy, government or rule by fathers, dominated women in the interests of men. Consciousness raising. I think that's what's happening with us, right? Definitely. Yeah. But to think that uh, the, the, let's say, where would he, where did he go? Uh, no. The, the last paragraph. Go back up. Yes. 
just just a bit. Keep going. Right, right, yeah, right there. Okay. Um, what is it said? The most? Oh no. Um, where is it? The most important. Uh, where, yeah, here we go. Oh. oh. Um, Keep going. I, I think you went too far up. Okay. This is the paragraph we just read. No. Are you looking yeah. at the most necessary? That word. No, medical fem feminist. So we, we, we were reading that paragraph. Okay, right there. Um, based on these discussions, so discussions that these women were having, the women drew the conclusion that the ending of patriarchy was the most, that was like the most critical necessary step toward a truly free society. So patriarchy, the male dominance, for male and every and for you know the, the not just male but the apis bull male it, it was it was you know all the rules were for them and anybody who didn't fit into that was a second class or so even other men right. who were if or you know who who was more like a woman in, in their presentation you know, even even they didn't, you know, fit into that male dominance, patriarchal uh, perception. So, if you wanted a, a truly free society, you have to get rid of patriarchy. That was the like number one thing that you have to get rid of. That's the conclusion they drew from. As I'm reading that paragraph as well, I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about how, okay, that focuses on the male-female issue, but it doesn't focus on the race issue and discrimination there and also in LGBT. Um, circles either. So based on, so what do you think of that then? Do you think that that's gonna, or say it's the most necessary step towards a truly free society? Seems like we have more than just that step though. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Well, well according, to, according to this, right. you know, this sentence, patriarchy <clears throat> was, wasn't really qualified. Um, but if we were to just interject white patriarchy, because you know, it's, it's the white dominant society, right? I mean, the reason we have racism is because w the whites feel threatened, right? By, they, they, they think they're gonna go ex extinct or they think they're gonna lose their power over other race. So it's still, I, I don't know, I, I think still it, it's, it's that white patriarchal because it's the, the laws were made for white people occasions right anything and 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 anybody that didn't fit into that mold was a second class citizen that should be uh, or uh, ruled over so i think that that patriarchy that that the the idea of dominance the apis bull and i think that whiteness Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that whiteness has to do a lot with it. That's that's what I was thinking. So this is a this is says this is the conclusion that they came to. The women drew the conclusion. Um, so I'm just I'm just trying to look at all the issues, um, racism, sexism, and homophobia, because they're all three. Yeah, to be just, I I mean, if I remember correctly, um, in in our studies. Most of your like your like your African, right? Like your African nation, they were okay, I think, with with women. They were okay with even homosexuality. They were okay until white man's Protestant religion was introduced to them 
And then the patriarchy uh, dominated. But before that, there was more of an equality even among um, what we call the third world country. You remember those studies that we had? I mean, they were, they had equality, they had more equality and they were okay with homosexuality until uh, the white man brought over um, uh, Protestantism. And even in the, in, 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 I think it was what, the Asian countries, like confusion, uh, no, confusion, Confucius, you know, um, I think it was Chinese culture that they were, uh, the, the Ming dynasties, the, you know, the, um, their di dynasty was okay. And even their kings and queens and royalties had homosexual relationship until Confucius was introduced. So, you know, before this religious, more moral religious, moral religiosity was introduced to their culture, they were okay. They were pretty much equal, male, female. I mean, even with uh, Islam, you know, that's what uh, Muhammad, you know, was introduced was introducing equality between men and women. And so, you know, before Protestantism was introduced to their country, they were, most countries were, I would say, pretty much equal between men, women. Homosexuals were accepted, accepted. Effeminate men were accepted. So are you linking, are you linking this dominance to religion? Using well, I'm, I, I think I'm, well, I'm thinking, I think I'm linking more to white, uh, white men, white male dominance, which religion does play a part into it, which is Protestantism. Yeah. Uh, apostate Protestantism. Can I say something? I I think it's really important to also keep in um, mind the context of the histories and the mindset of what was happening at the time when these um, well when this movement was being developed. Right. Um, and to keep the history in mind, you know, so that we are in their minds, you know, not not necessarily in their minds, but we understand a whole lot better the mindset of what, of the movement at the time it was being developed and, you know, the context of how everything was at that time. Um, you know, especially when you're wanting to uh, think about um, race, you know, um, the LGBTQ plus community, um, you know, or even in the context of going back into um, other histories that Bell was going on to, um, you know, in other cultures, because I know that in those, in back in those histories, that um, there was inequality within those, you know, um, histories as well, you know, in those other cultures. Um, and so um, it's just really important to understand kind of like the, the whole historical concept, uh, context of, you know, what was happening in the, the mindset of the people, because back then they didn't see, you know, as we learned too, they didn't see um, homosexuality as we see it today. You know, that's really new for us. That's unprecedented in our time. Um, I'm not saying that there, you know, there wasn't, you know, um, homosexuals back in those days, but just saying that the whole idea of what we uh, see as, you know, homosexual relationships was, it, it's not connected. Well, that's a different thing, but I'm just saying the the way we see it, our minds today is different than those historical contexts back in the um back in the day. So I, I think it's also important for us to remember too, to keep in mind that um, the history, the mindset of the history of which we go back to. Um, and even as we read this document, um, the history of when this was being, when the movement was, the feminist movement was being raised up, you know, um, and their mindset. 
and you know and how this was you know coming about I just wanted to put that out there yeah it's, it's true because like I mean if you're just we don't read probably novels right um but we probably have in our past but reading a book in even reading the bible you you need to get inside the writer's mind and you can't get inside the writer's mind until you go back into the history in what they're experiencing and how they're experiencing and um and then there's also the various perspectives you know so there's a lot to to put together and and and, and you know all throughout history speaking of history Religion has always been a tool to control the people. It's the easiest way. You know, in Babylon, in, 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 in any kind of religion, it doesn't matter what religion it was, but religion was the easiest way. I was just thinking that, how, how, um, how it's, religions always used to be the power, that, that they, they gravitate, gravitate, it seems, towards for when they want power, they gravitate, I don't know if this is right to say, gravitate towards religion, to use religion for their power. You know, if, if people stop and slow down and take a look, well, okay, how did you get in control and in charge? This control that you're fearing that you're gonna lose somewhere down the line. Well, you know, the new thing is, we're not going to bring up slavery in the history or in school anymore. You know, that's a new move to stop it. When you look and see how whoever took control of this country and how they did it, it's sad. It'll make a sick man sick. That they don't want to bring up. They want to be in control. But how did you get in control if you passionately, gracefully entered that realm, was elected to do so? No problem. But when you forcibly killed, marched and killed, slaves and killed. That's how you got in control. You better stop and look at it again. That's do not to last forever. An awful lot to examine hearts for, isn't there? Yeah, and, and, and another thing is, is um, like you take all these different inequality groups that are have been oppressed, you know, women, uh, you know, uh, um, Indigenous peoples, uh, uh, immigrants, um, uh, you know, different colors and different races. They all have this, the, you know, the people who are the patriarchal society that take the control, they all want to have control. It's that apis bull that, that Fel was talking about. But there's one group that's completely different from that. And that's the LGBT. And that group, they don't want to control them. They want to eradicate them. So it's a it's a it's very different. The LGBTQ group is very different than all the others because the white patriarchal mindset can live with the other groups as long as they're in control, but they don't want to live with the LGBT. So that's a that's a whole different mind. They want to eradicate them because they think they're evil and they're doing something that's wicked, you see. Yeah. I was just thinking so we can hear we can hear Moses going to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. People have to wake up and realize the slavery that they're actually in, the bondage that they're in. Or they, and um, what side of the whole thing they stand on. Women and men. Red stockings. Within groups such as New York Radical Women, 1967 through 1969, not connected to the present day socialist feminist organization, Radical Women, which Ellen Willis characterized as the first women's liberation group in New York City, a radical feminist ideology began to emerge. It declared, that the, pers the personal is political and the sisterhood is powerful. Calls to women's activism coined by Kathy Sarachild and others. In the group, 
New York radical women fell apart in early 1969 in what came to be known as the political feminist split, with the politicals seeing capitalism as the main source of women's oppression, while the feminists saw women's oppression in a male supremacy that was a set of material institutionalized relations, not just bad attitudes. The feminist side of the split, whose members referred to themselves as radical feminists, soon constituted the basis of a new organization, Red Stockings. At the same time, Ty Grace Atkinson led a radical split off from now, which became known as the Feminists. A third major stance would be articulated by the New York Radical, radical Feminist, founded later in 1969 by Shulamith Firestone, who broke from the Red Stockings and Anne Cote. During this period, the movement produced a prodigious output of leaflets, pamphlets, journals, magazines, articles, newspapers, and radio and TV interviews. Many important feminist works, such as Coates' essay, The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm, 1970, and Kate Millett's book, book, Sexual Politics, 1970, emerged during this time and in this milieu. Ideology emerges and diverges. At the beginning of this period, heterosexuality was more or less an unchallenged assumption. Among radical feminists, among radical feminists, it was widely held that, thus far, the sexual freedoms gained in the sexual revolution of the 1960s, in particular, the decreasing emphasis in monogamy, had been largely gained by men at women's expense. This assumption of heterosexuality would soon be challenged by the rise of political lesbianism closely associated with Atkinson and the feminists. Red Stockings and the feminists were both radical feminist organizations, but held rather distinct views. Most members of Red Stockings held to a materialist and anti-psychologist view. They viewed men's oppression of women as ongoing and deliberate, holding individual men responsible for this oppression, viewing institutions and systems, including the family, as mere vehicles of conscious male intent and rejecting psycho psychologistic explanations of female submissiveness as blaming women for collaboration in their own oppression. They held to view which Willis could later describe as neo-Maoist, that it would be possible to unite all or virtually all women as a class to confront this oppression by personally confronting men. Ellen Willis. The feminists held a more idealistic, psychologistic. Sorry, Phil. Um, but was that the first division within radical feminism? Is the red stockings and the feminists? It sounds like it. Okay. So this is the beginning at, in this period um, of the division of radical feminism? So they were, they were both radical feminists, right? Yeah. You had it up here in the first paragraph. I was looking back. Um, let's see. It declared that the personal is political, which is what Elder Tess put on the radical side. And the sisterhood is powerful, calls, calls to women's activism coined by Kathy, Sarah Child, and others in the group. New York radical women fell apart in early 1969 in what became in what came to be known as political feminist split. So there's a split here with the politicos seeing capitalism 
as the main source of women's oppression, while the feminists saw women's oppression in a male supremacy that was a set of material institutionalized relations, not just bad attitudes. The feminist side of the split, whose members referred to themselves as radical feminists, soon constituted the basis of a new organization, Red Stockings. So you had a split up here, the political split and the feminists, the politicals and the feminists, and out of that, the feminists start this new organization, the Red Stockings, and then you see a split from there, if I followed that correctly. Well, it sounds like, you, okay, so at first you had a split from feminists so to, to radical feminism, which is Red Stocking. So that was one radical uh, feminist, the Red Stockings. And then at the same time, uh, Ty Atkinson had a rad radical split off from now. So one from political, the other one from now. Uh, and so the one from now became known as, as a feminist. So they're both radical, both radical, but believed in two different things. Yeah, and then there's another one because it says a third major stance would be articulated by the New York radical feminists. But a third stance. Who broke from the red stockings. Found it later. So you can see okay. it's splintering quite a bit. Right, so you see it's like three splinterings, but they're all radical. So I, I don't know, I don't know as of yet if we have read what they have in common. I, we know what they have in difference. Yeah. Uh, we, one believe in, uh, I think, what do they say, uh, um, capitalism? Yeah. And the other uh, did not. So we know what the difference is, but what 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 made them radical? Um, maybe it'll explain later what they had in common. Yeah. And I'm you know I'm wondering now if at back at this time maybe um you know at, at back at this time if they accepted um, LGBTQIA back at this time or not. But it's not mentioned here. So, at you know, what point did the radical feminism accept LGBTQIA? Okay. So we're down here, right? Uh, we're at uh, political lesbian and closely associated with Atkinson and feminists. So, red stockings and the feminists. Mm. I, we were right here with Ellen Wills, right? Or did we already read part of that? I, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the feminists held a more idealistic, psychologistic, and utopian philosophy with a great emphasis, greater emphasis on sex roles, seeing sexism as rooted in complementary patterns of male and female behavior. They placed more emphasis on institutions, seeing marriage, family, prostitution, and heterosexuality as all existing to perpetuate the sex role system. They saw all of these as institutions to be destroyed within the group. Sorry. Within the group, there were further disagreements such as Coates viewing the institution of normal sexual intercourse as being focused mainly on male sexual or erotic pleasure, while Atkinson viewed it mainly in terms of reproduction. In Can contrast to the- Meaning sex only served the purpose to get pregnant? Is that what that means? That's what, that's what it sounds like mainly in terms of reproduction. So one is for, one said, one group said, it's for, it's for male sexual or erotic pleasure. 
So again, it's just for male. And the well, Atkinson viewed it as mainly in terms of reproduction. So in contrast to the red stockings, the feminist generally considered genitally focused sexuality to be inherently male. Ellen Willis, the red stockings co-founder would later write that insofar as the red stockings considered abandoning heterosexual activity, they saw it, they saw it as a bitter price. They might have to pay for their militants, whereas the feminists embraced separatist feminism as a strategy. The New York radical feminist took a more psychologistic and even biologically determinist line. They argued that men dominated women, not so much for material benefit as for the ego satisfaction intrinsic in domination. Similarly, they rejected the Red Stockings view that women submitted only out of necessity or the feminists implicit view that they submitted out of cowardice, but instead argued that social conditioning simply led most women to accept a submissive role as right and natural. I think this is really important to really understand these division, these um, sex, sect of divisions of feminism um, right here, um, because they're, we're seeing the mindset of um, the different divisions, or I should say the splits of radical feminism here. Right. Um, which is interesting. Um, but it's so much better for me. I don't know about anyone else, but to have it written because my mind, when, when one group is stated and then the other, I'm trying to, you know, categorize it in my head, you know, um, as you know, it's being read. Um, so I'm following, but it does make it a little bit more tricky when you're trying to follow along the, the different groups, you right. know, um, you know, and it's, for me, I like, I have to write it, you know, to see um, how it was split up and then who is thinking what, you know? Um, I mean, I can follow, but I'm just saying it, yeah. It, it could very well be, uh, as I see it, that all these women were correct in their own perspective. They're all, they're all correct. Um, I mean, it's too bad that there were these splits, but I don't think these splits were necessary. And, and, you know, and the way I see it is that all these splits, you know, everybody has their own experiences and everybody has their own history. So, you know, this, this split, this, this women, group of women maybe had a, you know, what the experience of what they were saying. And another group had their own experience of what they were saying. And another group had their own experience of what they were saying. So, so in my mind, essentially, they all had different experiences, but they were all oppressed by men. And, uh, and, and, and these oppressions were manifested in different ways. So they were just bringing in their own view to the table, but it looks like these ladies could not put their heads together to say, yeah, everybody's right. So they have to go their own, own separate ways, which I think is too bad. Forms of action. The radical feminism of the late 60s was not only a movement of ideology and theory, it helped to inspire direct action. In 1968, feminists protested against the Miss America pageant in order to bring sexist beauty ideas and social expectations to the forefront of women's social issues. 
Even though bras were not burned on that day, the protest led to the phrase bra burner. Feminists threw their bras along with women garbage, such as girdles, false eyelashes, steno pads, wigs, women's magazines, and dishcloth into a freedom, can, freedom trash, trash can. But, but they did not set it on fire. In March of 1970, more than 100 feminists staged an 11-hour sit-in at the Ladies' Home Journal headquarters. These women demanded that the publication replace its male editor with a female editor and accused the Ladies' Home Journal with their emphasis on food, family, fashion, and femininity of being instruments of women's oppression. One protester explained the goal of the protest by saying that they were there to destroy a publication which feeds off a woman's anger and frustration, a magazine which destroys women. So a male editor in Ladies Home Journal to perpetuate, if that's the right way to say it, um, the role and position of women, get them all reading their little magazine so that they can read what little women are supposed to do and stay in their nice little teeth, nice little um, tidy, submissive corner. Is that a fair summary or wrong? But their emphasis on food, family, fashion, and femininity of being instruments of women's oppression. Yes. This is how women were supposed to act. So you have a male editor in the magazine that drives it rather than putting a female there to get into the minds of females and let's direct it to who females really are and what females really want and what they're really about. Radical feminists used a variety of tactics, including demonstrations, speak outs, and community and work-related organizing to gain exposure and adherence. In France and West Germany, radical feminists developed further forms of direct action. Self-incrimination. On June, on June 6, 1971, the cover of Stern showed 28 German actresses and journalists confessing we had an abortion. Wir haben Abgetrieben. Unleashing a campaign against the abortion ban. The journalist Alice Schwarzer had organized this avowal form of protest following a French example. Later in 1974, Schwarzer persuaded 329 doctors to publicly admit in Der Spiegel to having performed abortions. She also found the woman willing to terminate her pregnancy on camera with vacuum aspiration, thereby promoting this method of abortion by showing it on the German political television program, Panorama. Christina Parancioli described this as a new tactic the ostentatious publicly documented violation of a law that millions of women had broken thus far, only in secret and under undignified circumstances. However, with strong opposition from church groups and most of the broadcasting councils governing West Germany's ARD, Association of Public Broadcasters, the film was not aired. Instead, Panorama's producers replaced the time slot with a statement of protest and the display of an empty studio. So on the subject of abortion, since that's um, pretty going on heavy in the Supreme Court now, I, I'm surprised the more I understand the, what Texas did to, I mean, I, I I understood portions of it, but I think I'm understanding more of it as we continue to go forward, but to, to basically um, create vigilantes to go do something 
you know, to go and, and sue and what have you, anybody that aids and abeds and, and a woman getting an abortion. And yet all the while, an abortion is constitutionally legal. That's really sick when you think about it. I, I mean, I just wish people would understand what that what that means. But then the other thing about abortion on my mind is, is the woman that that doesn't have the right to choose what is best for her own life. Um, and and that's that's one part of it. But the other part of it is they never put the man in the picture. They never put the impregnator in the picture. It's all on the woman. Right. That is very, very right. I mean, that's that's always bothered me too. Because women don't get pregnant on their own. No. And and uh, you know, and there's all the things. Well, she shouldn't have been doing this, she shouldn't have been doing that. Well, yes. we don't know the circumstances of when, when and how. I know from my own previous experience to try to be vague, I guess, try to be, um, men can be very manipulative and charming or what have you, you know, whatever, whatever path that may be. And and uh women being this submissive role or maybe insecurities or, or what have you. I mean, I'm not saying all women, but there may be women that, that, that do, do wind up pregnant for, for their own weak insecurity reasons they wind up in that situation. I, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios that can go there, but regardless, there's no man put in the picture and nobody seems to to bat an eyelash at that right and also what it implies is you know the abortion issue is that women don't don't have the mindset that they can't make decisions they can't make intelligent decisions that the state has to come in and yeah and regulate them because they just can't make the right decisions. And I've been watching some of the that program made that you guys talked about. And uh, the one that's on Netflix. Yeah, that was a good series, actually. Yeah, I've been picking up some of that today. And and to just see the, the trap. I mean, this this woman here doesn't, from everything that I've seen so far, and I, I watched the whichever one of you it was that posted that. Um, video the interview interview with her about the show i didn't see anything in in her suggesting that she ever thought of abortion i don't know if that comes up in this i mean because there's going to be women that are just there's no way i'm not going to have an abortion or maybe in the circumstances she was in at the time in the relationship not seeing um you know not seeing where this is going where the relationship is going and what's going to happen yeah. but go ahead yeah, they didn't, they didn't bring up the abortion issue. The only thing about that was that when she got pregnant, uh, the, her boyfriend at the time didn't want the child. Okay. And that was the only issue, but she never considered abortion. Okay. Yeah. So that was, yeah. Okay. So, um, so, you know, what are you going to do? Because in watching this, this, I didn't have, I was really thankful. There were a lot of times where in the situation that I was in, it was many, many years ago. And I was very thankful that I never got pregnant because it would have been really difficult. I mean, I, I at least knew that much. It would have been really difficult to go on with your life and try to, to um, whatever, provide for yourself. And, in, in, in uh, you know, if you wanted a career, or you wanted this, or you wanted that, you couldn't if you were on your own with a baby. And to watch the, the struggles that she has to every, every, you know, all the systems that are, that are in place, they seem to work against often the ones that are in need. And, and I always thought that too, that the, the system seems to favor the criminals, the ones that know how to get around the system, um, but not the innocent ones that truly need help. But that also bothers me when it comes to abortion too, because with, with what they're, with what they're doing and trying to take down Roe v. Wade is, they're, they're, the, the men are not in the picture, and then when the women, okay, they have the, they, they want to protect the unborn child, and they abandon 
the unborn child and the woman after she's had her baby and make it extremely difficult for her to try to rise above all that when everything's stacked against her down. She can't, you know, you're in a corner and what can you do? Because it really isn't about the unborn child. No, it's not. Yeah, that's just a good, uh, that's just a, a convenient excuse to yeah. some women. Yeah. Yeah. And I pray more people come to see that. Uh, so the the anti-abortion, you know, as you just mentioned, it's not, you know, the the protection of the child is a is a is a cover up. Right? It's, it's, it's the it's the line that is used because oh, this you know poor unborn child. Uh, but it's it's but it's the the dominance again, the dominance over a, an, another person's body. It keeps them in power. And in, in control. Right. It keeps the men in power because it's the men, it's the men who made the rule. It keeps and the that, women, it keeps the women oppressed and unable to stand. Oppressed. Exactly. Because women are in, in the eyes of the, those who made the rules, which are men, women are, you know, they're defined with by their functions. So, you know, you have you have children. It'll keep our society going. So we, we, so we will not, so as men, we will not allow you to have abortion because we want more male progeny. Progeny? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Until you get a woman who gets mad. Yeah. So you get a woman that gets mad and starts to fight back and that's what they do that's what they that's what this is all about is women fighting back against these things yeah i mean as we read earlier all, all they want is self-determination and, and and not allowing them to have the abortion is it's far from self-determination so it just seems to me that if they want to um, force women to have babies that they that they can't afford, that you know whatever the circ all the circumstances are, then then the male, the impregnator, should be held accountable to take care of financially take care of so that that woman can go do what she needs to do as well. Well, the thought is. I mean that. I mean that's that's the right thing to do. But if you look at it in in the apis bull, we can't condemn another dominant because they're you know the one who dominated is in the right. I mean if you if you, if you look at it in in the, in the eyes of the apis bull, the one the 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 penetrator is is the dominant one is is in the right. So how can he be? How can he be in the picture? Yeah, I mean, we, we know that he should be. Yeah. But if you you know you think this through, he's a dominant one, he's a penetrator. He he can he cannot be in the picture. I think Donna wanted to say something. But Donna, go ahead. I was just gonna say that um, I'm doing this study right now, and um Tess, Elder Tess actually compares um that a, a couple, the man a, as a church and state, the man representing state and the woman representing the church, kind of the same contrast, you know, compare and contrast. It's all about control. Yeah. In circumventing the abortion ban. In the 1970s, radical women centers without a formal hierarchy sprang up in West Berlin. Without a formal hierarchy sprang up in West Berlin. These Berlin-based women centers did abortion counseling, 
compiled a list of Dutch abortion clinics, organized regular bus trips to them, and were utilized by women from other parts of West Germany. Police accused the organizers of an illegal conspiracy. The center used these arrests to publicize its strategy of civil You got a delay there, or did you not see it change? No. Oh, there we go. Civil disobedience and race. Civil disobedience and race such a public outcry that the prosecutions were dropped. The bus trips continued without police interference. This victory was politically significant in two respects. While the state did not change the law, it did back off from enforcing it, deferring to women's collective power. The feminist claim to speak for women was thus affirmed by both women and the state. Mm -hmm. Leaving the church. In West Germany, 1973 saw the start of a radical feminist group campaign to withdraw from membership in the Catholic Church as a protest against its anti-abortion position and activities. Can we continue to be responsible for funding a male institution that condemns us as ever to the house, to, to cooking and having children, but above all to having children? In Germany, those baptized in one of the officially recognized churches have to document that they have formally left the church in order not to be responsible for paying a church tax. Protest of biased coverage of lesbians. In November of 1972, two women in a sexual relationship, Marion Inns and Judy Anderson, were arrested and charged with hiring a man to kill In's abusive husband. Pre-trial publicity, particularly that by Bild, Germany's largest tabloid, was marked by anti-lesbian sensationalism. In response, lesbian, lesbian groups and women's centers in Germany joined in fervent protest. The cultural clash continued through the trial, which eventually resulted in the conviction of the women in October of 1974 and life sentences for both. However, a petition brought by 146 female journalists and 41 male colleagues to the German Press Council resulted in its censure of the Axel Springer Company, Bill's publisher. At one point in the lead up, the trial in, in one, at one point in the lead up to the trial, Bild had run a 17 consecutive day series on the crimes of lesbian women. General self exams. Help women to gain, gain knowledge about their, how their own bodies function so they would no longer need to rely solely on the medical profession. An outgrowth of this movement was the founding of the Feminist Women's Health Center in Berlin in 1974. Social organization and aims. Does anybody else like to read? I was just thinking in that last passage, it's, it's amazing what can happen when you get a little education. Yeah, I'm not just talking about that, but I mean, when you, when you educate your mind, um, then start getting some intelligence on, on you know, because here they are, they're left to the medical profession to tell them instead of even understanding how their own bodies function. Yeah, and it's amazing. It's still that way. Yeah, another form of suppression. Well, now we got Google. We can search all kinds of things on Google. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, mo most of the... Um, even today, most of the research, uh, the medical research, are done on male and, and not on females. 
And so, and then they just translate that over, over to the females. But uh, females' bodies, you know, they, they work differently than males. Uh, for, for example, you know, like, like um, you know, in heart attacks, yeah. you know, we have that, we have that um, the typical, you know, the male, uh, you know, the heart, you know, that could radiate to the jaw, they could radiate to the back, that could radiate to the shoulders, uh, you know, and, and that's what, that's what we're, you know, we push both male and female. And, but females, you know, present a heart attack symptoms very differently they don't have these um you know the the, the chest you know, i mean they might have chest pain but it might be more like indigestion rather than you know the the chest pain with with radiation to the arms and the jaws and the back and it's, it's very more diffused for females having a heart attack more diffused and and, and so therefore they can't really pinpoint uh, of what's going on, you know, that they're, 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 they can't really realize that they're having a heart attack because it just kind of feels like a diffused pain. It's not specific. Uh, yet we have these same symptoms because we studied males and we just placed them on the females also. Okay, any, would anybody else like to read? I was thinking we got um, 10 minutes left and we're at a new section. Well, maybe we'll go down to this section. We'll finish this little section then. Okay. I will. Unless somebody else wants to. Uh, nobody? Okay. I'll go ahead. I'll just do this section and then we'll have a little discussion and close off. So social organization and aims. Radical feminists have generally formed small activist or community associations around either consciousness raising or concrete aims. Many radical feminists in Australia participated in a series of squats to establish various women's centers. And this form of action was common in the late 1970s and early 1980s. The thing that I find also interesting about this is, you, is how branched off women are in, in all of this, because these these radical feminist women have to actually fight women. What was the woman's name? Somebody remembers her that um, Elder Tess mentioned. We all watched a bunch of videos on her, and I can't think of her name. The little sweet housewife woman. Sorry, I might be saying that. Really, I don't mean that mean. But are you talking about uh, Phyllis Schlafly? Yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. I watched a bunch of her videos, and it's just they're just in they they just live in a different world. And I don't know. It, I don't. I don't know how to explain it, but they just really have different views, and and have no desire to be. They don't feel they're enslaved, and they have no desire to act and be on their own mind. And yet, she had a career in politics, right? Yes. Yeah. She has the uh, Eagle. Uh, she leads the Eagle Forum. And it makes me think of Amy Coney Barrett as well. Yeah. She takes that submissive role as well. And yet here she sits on the Supreme Court. Yeah. You know, I don't know how this relates, but but when I came out of that emotionally abusive situation many, many, many years ago, there was a couple of books that, and I've talked about this to some of you, but there was a couple of books that I read that really, really helped me in particular at that time. and um, And one of them, this was about the time that Oprah Winfrey, her show had just um, come on. That's how far back this was. Um, her show had only been on maybe a year and I was watching. I had moved out from with this man that I was living with. I had moved out and had my own apartment, had a job. And, uh, and I was watching Oprah one day before I went to work. And this doctor, doc, maybe some of you heard of her, Susan Forward, was um, her guest, and she was talking about the book that she that she wrote, and it's called Men Who Hate Women and the Women Who Love Them. And uh, she was talking about how she's a she was a psychologist, and if anybody maybe remembers the name, she was the psychologist that Nicole Brown Simpson saw just before her murder. And um, so she was a psychologist, and she had been counseling married couples for 
like 20 years. And she would, you know, she, I don't know how to say, she, she came to realize one day in this one couple, this one particular couple, and I don't remember the details of it, this one particular couple. So all of a sudden she saw herself and she went home from work and she realized that when she was at work, she was in, um, a, um, I don't, I'm, I'm going to say the wrong words because it's been so long, but she was a powerful, independent, strong woman. And every time she walked into the house, she was the little woman and it was criticized and, and um, kept in that suppressed whole environment and just never realized that that's what her marriage was. So here she is counseling um, couples for 20 years and not even realizing that that was her life. And, and I went out and got that book because it hit me with right where I was at and went out and, and read, read that book in like three weeks and not three weeks. I read that book in a few days and literally turned my life upside down to the doormat person that I was to realizing. So, but it, but it's interesting because you have women that, why are they there? Why would Shackley, was that her name? You know, are they there because they really want to, or are they there because of ignorance or, you know, I don't know, but so you have the, the radical feminists, they have to even fight, fight women for, for their rights. You don't even have to just fight men, you fight women that are suppressed by men for your own rights. Okay. So by the mid 1980s, many of the original consciousness raising groups so consciousness raising or concrete aims um, had, had dissolved and radical feminism was more and more associated with loosely organized university collectives. Radical feminism can, be, can still be seen particularly within student activism and among working class women. In Australia, many feminist social organizations had accepted government funding during the 1980s and the election of a conservative government in 1996 crippled these organizations. So we don't like them to get educated and smart and wise on these ideas. And that's what I always saw is that, that men see it as a threat when a strong woman um, might be a friend of your wives, of your, of your wife, if you know what I'm saying strong women are a threat and they don't want their women, their, their wives around other strong women because they're gonna put all these bad ideas in their head. I was not, um, I'm not saying that was good. If you know what I mean, I think you know what I mean. So there's a threat when they're around, when they're around strong women. So radical feminism can see, be seen particularly within student activism and among working class women. In Australia, many feminist social organizations had accepted government funding and the election of a conservative government crippled these organizations. A radical feminist movement also emerged among Jewish women in Israel beginning in the early 70s. While radical feminists aim to dismantle patriarchal society, their immediate aims are generally concrete. Common demands include expanding reproductive rights. According to writer Lisa Tuttle in the Encyclopedia of Feminism, you know, it's just interesting, uh, popped into my head when in um, that the woman, how does it say it in Genesis that she was going to give birth in, uh, how does it say it? Um, but it's interesting to see the connection, the end from the beginning. Because childbearing changed, was changed after sin, right? Are you saying are you saying that um, um, Genesis shall give birth in pain? Isn't that what it says? Yes. I'm thinking about what would that look like parabolic, par, you know, as a parable today. What would it look like that there's that it's in the beginning. Or you know when sin first came in, that curse involved the female being the one that is going to carry the child, right? Yes. And here we have at the end, 
it's the same, it's, it's an issue that's related to the female that is the one that carries the child. That's as far as I can go with that right now, but maybe some of you have some thoughts on that that for later. So expanding reproductive rights, according to writer Lisa Tuttle in the Encyclopedia of Feminism, it was defined by feminists in the 1970s as a basic human right. It includes the right to abortion and birth control, but implies much more to be realized because they don't, you know, there are women that don't want to have children and the men want them to have children to keep them suppressed so that they can't determine, self-determine what they want to do, what they want to be, um, because they're going to be busy taking care of kids, because that's your obligation, because that's your function. That's your function. That's what you have to do. I can kind of see, I am like see a vague um, connection with Genesis, but I'll have to look at it later. To be realized, reproductive freedom must include not only women's right to choose childbirth, abortion, sterilization, or birth control, but also her right to make those choices freely without pressure from individual men, doctors, governmental or religious authorities. It is a key issue for women since without it, the other freedoms we appear to have, such as the right to education, jobs and equal pay may prove illusory. Provisions of childcare, medical treatment and society's attitude towards children are also involved. Changing the organizational sexual culture, e.g. breaking down traditional gender roles and reevaluating societal concepts of femininity and masculinity, a common demand in US universities during the 80s. In this, they often formed tactical alliances with other currents of feminism. So yeah, I kind of get a little, I have to go, I think when I, before I go to sleep tonight, I'm going to look into this one a little bit more and look back into Genesis because this, this, I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on it, but that it was going to always be a, um, oh, snare is not even the right word. Child, childbirth is a, it's definitely a privilege and I'm, you know, thankful for my two children, but I'm thinking about how it's kind of used to it what it seems to be with the abortion issue it's a, it seems to be a way to continue to keep women enslaved it's like a blessing and a curse yeah 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 and and uh but they use the they use the um pro life whole thing to keep the women enslaved and it really bothers me though that that the men are not accountable and a woman has, can, cannot, you know, it, when it's, you know, she either has to risk her life for an abortion or possibly die having an abortion or forced to have the baby where then she can't afford to feed it. She can't go to work. She can't get daycare. She can't, you know, all the different traps that you wind up in unless you have some sort of support. Now there are women out there that wind up with, you know, support systems that, that they can climb out of that, but it's like it's like a battle that that you have to fight your way out of. I, mean, I had my own battles. I had two kids and got divorced um, due to the alcoholism in the in the house, and uh, and had to. That was one. I would say it's the second hardest thing because I if Tony's still with us, I told her what my hardest thing was. I think she got off the line, um, but. I, I remember building the 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 business that I'm that I do now. I mean, I'm just self-employed, my own, I don't have anything big and grand. It's just a daily operation that I do, daily service that I do for these customers. But I started with nothing. I started with not even knowing how to operate a computer. And then when it came to the marriage falling apart, um, here I am with two kids, and I do have a roof over my head, and I believe I have a roof over my head. Well, for one, because of God when I didn't even know him. And, um, and I had a determination, you know, I, I had already had a career, I'd had a career, I worked at Nordstrom and would have gone on to be higher up in managing. But I wanted to be a, I did want to be a mom. And I wanted to be with my kids. So I quit my job. So anyways, I started doing the, the work that I do now, 
And um, and I just, I know that he helped me along the way. So, but what I was trying to say is that it was a struggle. It was always a struggle. I didn't have the help from Mike and um, financially, and it was always a struggle. And there are things that do come against you all the time. I mean, I, I, one incident when the police came to the, not just one or two, but my house was surrounded. And I, to this day, I thank God that it was 1.30 and not after two o'clock when the kids would have been home. But they surrounded the house because they were on a sweep for people with warrants. And Mike was, you know, he's not a criminal in the aspect of violent criminal, but he caused accidents and different things from drunk driving. And, and so, so they were on a sweep to go get, um, you know, to go get, uh, you know, round up all these people with warrants. And, and that would happen kind of frequently. And that one particular time, though, they were in the backyard. My dogs got out. They were at the front door. They had the house surrounded and their guns out. And, um, and I don't know why that came to my mind, but but the things, but the fight and the struggle, that's what I was trying to get at. The fight and the struggle to just make it. And I, I feel like I had, even though I didn't have help, um, like family help, I didn't have, I had a little bit of family help, but for the most part, my family didn't have anything to really help with. So, so, but I did have some family help, but, um, but it was a struggle to try to do all that with two kids. And I remember thinking after doing the business that I was doing, the kids were getting older and I thought, man, I don't ever, I, this is all I know how to do. And I don't want to have to try to change course um, at some point because I do not have the energy that I had to put into it to, to get it to where it was at. So it's a struggle and it's a fight. And I can't imagine the women like with this, this, um, program made and having to go through I didn't have to face what she had to face and it is a fight and it is a battle it does make you stronger I mean for that I'm thankful because it makes you stronger but it really has to be the rights there has to be rights for women there has to be rights for women I, I mean I could truly see that because they just suppress the women and they keep them suppressed and then if they do get smart wise, um, educated, they start to fight back, then you just have another battle there. That they, and I think it's just really tragic that they have to fight women as well. I'm sorry for the rambling. But um, yeah, sorry about that. So well, I guess we have um, your head. Just to say, um, when you talk about the fight against women, because we know radical feminism is just one um, faction of feminism that, or division or sect of feminism. So you have the mainstream and the cultural of, and all these different, and you know, those are the three major divisions. Um, you know, and you have all these different sects of feminism, and there is women fighting, uh, especially radical feminism. Um, with and within radical feminism, we see women still fighting um, because um, it's a mindset. It's a it's a war against uh, not only for our rights, you know, but just a change of mindset you know, um, and for people to come out of the wrong mindset, that is a battle. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's something we can understand because I know, um, and coming out of some of the conservative conservatism I was in. Yeah. And, and it's funny because, I, you know, I've, I'm a kind of a young person, you know, in this, um, but, you know, it's, it's really interesting how much, you know, I picked up and what I was, my mind was thinking, you know, and the things that I was thinking is sad, you know, and partially, you know, because, you know, I did embrace some of those conservative views, you know, and um, that affected my life, um, you know, and, but I just want to say that, yeah, it is a fight. Um, because it's it's really a fight um, over the mindset, you know, and and what women think of them. I mean, we all know 
you know, understand the oppression and, and all of that. But it really is um, a fight when, when you stand for equality, you know, and, um, uh, and, and getting into the minds of people to explain what that looks like, because everybody has a different view of of what that um, of what that is, you know, um, and we understand that, um, especially with the patriarchal system and what um, um, male suprem supremacy and and all of that, and and just the the bondage, you know, it's just um, it really is a fight. Um, and to take away to fight for equality they view it as taking away something from them. Yeah. In other words, they don't want to give up what they have in order for you to be treated fair and equal. Yeah. And, and uh, they don't want to give it up. Huh. Victoria, would you like to close this in prayer? Or somebody else can say something? Yeah, I just want to thank you, ladies, for um, your your testimonies. It's, you know, this is something as you know, being a man doesn't quite, you know, I never had to go through that, so I never had to experience that. So you know, I I don't, you know, I didn't, I never had to feel that way. So thank you for the education. You know, I was just thinking today. I don't know why I was thinking it, but I was just thinking of all. You know, when I was a Protestant, the worst thing that we were always talking about was taking the mark of the beast. And we never really truly understood what that mark was, but we knew that we had to find out what it was because we didn't want it. Because we knew that once you took the mark of the beast, that that was it. And then I thought to myself, like, all these, all these conservative Protestants, or people that think they know God, they're all setting themselves up to take the mark of the beast in their forehead, and they don't even know it. Yeah. I was just, how do you tell them? How do you, I mean, because they still have hope, but once we get to the big close of probation, I think it is, there's no hope for them. And I'm thinking, wow. That was such a, I don't know how, you know, I'm thinking of my friends and my conservative Protestant friends. I'm thinking, there's nothing I could say. I, I don't even know what to say. They're just so, their minds are so, you know, it's just, it makes me so sad, you know, because their biggest fear, taking the mark of the beast, is exactly what they're going through right now. They're, they're, they're setting up for it. And they don't even know it. And even if I were to explain it to them, I don't think they would ever even believe it. You know? So I was just really saddened by that thought. Yeah, I hear you. When we really think about the reality of, of what we're what we're learning, yeah, the effect of it, and to see the the the, the pull out of the conservatives of conservatism and then getting in the trap of liberalism and people having to come out of that trap into this movement and to to see to actually because i know that there's people that you can't even talk to about it you can't even you 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 can't reason they can't reason and and they have such differently formed mindsets that they, that they you, you can't talk to them. And, and it's really sad when you see that because and the, the, the thing that makes it even worse is they are believe, they're feeling sad for you because you're lost in darkness. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, I hear you. No, 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 no. What was I, that? I just wanted to, say, I just wanted to say this to Don and probably all of us is about that um, mindset because we've all experienced that. I think our friends and stuff, we, we just, they're just, you just can't say anything. That's just what Don was saying to you. Everybody expressed that. And the answer 
I don't think the answer so much is because once we realize that we can't really talk to them because they're locked in, their minds are locked into that mindset that we're not going to be able to rationally um, put forth any kind of argument or a um, just the logic to bring them past that. And it seems so hopeless. And because I feel that too with people I know and stuff, but the, I just want to encourage everybody that these people aren't lost and that there's something that is very powerful that we need to be doing and that's interceding and, and yeah. praying for these yeah. people like we've yeah. never prayed before because this is the only hope they have is us praying for them. I do believe some will, yeah. some will come out. I do, I do believe. Yeah. That. And, that's why, some, yeah. and that's why I did say that, you know, they are sitting up for it because they're not they still have hope <laughs> you know they're still you know but the farther they go with this mindset the longer they hold on to it the chances of them changing their mindset is getting harder and harder you know because they harden their heart yes to the truth like the pharaoh right right it hardens your heart yeah, we can just keep banging on the door of heaven. That's our thing. I remember there was a story about Ellen White, and she was going to pray for some friends of hers that were not uh, converted. And uh, she got a list up or something, and she just flat prayed until they were. And I think, I think over time, they all came to the truth and, and uh, came converted because she just wouldn't give up on this interceding prayer. So, uh, yeah, go in faith. Yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you very much. Victoria. Yeah, this has really been a great discussion. It's really helped, like Bell was gonna, saying, helping guys to understand a little bit more with those experiences that you ladies went through. I mean, I could see through certain people I've known and how things went their lives and all, but you girls really helped us, I think. Thank you. We're going to continue this next Wednesday for those that, that join us. Um, so that so we can understand radical feminism to be able to help. I was wondering if Victoria would like to close us in prayer. Oh, yeah, she's there. Good. I can close. Dear Lord. Thank you so much for this time we've had in Bible study and fellowship, Lord. We just ask that um, you would really help us, Lord, to understand the message um, that we're to give, Lord. And we thank you for this study on feminism, on radical feminism, to know and understand the history of it and where we stand in alignment with it as a movement. And um, we just pray that you will help us grow in our understanding and help us to um, have the message in our hearts and may it change and shape our lives um, that we will be living testimonies of the truth and um, that we may be able to share um, the hope that is in us, Lord, with others you bring into our network and, and reach. And I just pray that um, as we depart, you'll continue to be with us and um, bless us. And um, may you help us, Lord, because, you know, um, the fight is, is really real. And um, I know that it's challenging for some. So I just pray that you will keep us strong in faith, Lord, and help us to um, cling to the lines to cling to the message and to cling to you like never before in jesus name amen amen amen